Hello, Art History 2 students. I hope you are doing very well. Greetings from one of the world's great cities behind me, the highlight, kind of um, wonderful Tokyo, Japan, one of the great cities in the planet. Um, Japan, and actually here in Tokyo, is considered about the third largest city in the planet. Right now, there is a population here of about 25 million, and it is one of the most amazing, technologically advanced, clean, lovely cities that I have ever been to one of the best countries I've ever been to in terms of its well-organized structure. So as we think about Japan, we specifically want to think about why study Japan? So the top 10 of Japan that shows up. One is they're going to have an indigenous religion called Shintoism. And Shintoism is the belief in these nature spirits or the way of the kami. And that kind of precludes everything, including even today, in Japan, as you're walking around, there's almost no garbage cans. People pick up their own garbage, take it home. They have a real respect and reverence for the environment. We're going to see a different version of modern feminine beauty that comes out from geisha culture, which actually means moving work of art. This is the place on the planet where you can do electronic testing. They have a wonderful vending machines where you can actually buy a car, a phone, and it gets delivered to you within an hour. We have lovely anime, which has impacted the world in many ways, including new ways of making animation today. We have modern filmmaking come out of the Japanese classical cinema, specifically Kurosawa and now Miyazaki. We have the lovely idea of the woodblock print, the idea that actually is going to impact Impressionism and was earlier impact by the natural aspect of the raft of the Medusa of man versus nature. And it currently is the fifth largest economy focusing on this postmodern way of, of living. It really is a remarkable place. Where in the world is Japan? Here you can see off the coast of China. Japan is this long length of numerous islands, and it actually forms about the size of California. Japan is known largely throughout history for its wartime bellicose nature, particularly upon, amongst the, uh, the samurai. The samurai become almost medieval cultural heroes, the way that we do and have knights in the very West. The samurai's weapon of choice was the Yumi bow until the introduction of gunpowder and the rifle. And they also have the samurai sword um, that we will actually be talking about because we'll be seeing it in some of the woodblock prints for celebrity culture. The samurai, to give you an overview, here's a quick overview of the samurai and the impact that it has on modern Japanese culture. The Samurai In the Heian period, the imperial court relied on agriculture produced in distant estates. The wealthy landowners of these estates hired warriors to defend themselves from raids by local chieftains. By the 12th century, political power had shifted significantly away from the emperor. The Genpei War of 1180 to 1185 hit the Tyrant clan with sworn loyalty. And this to the is Emperor right during the transition from Romanesque to Gothic and the Western Minamoto world. And the Minamoto victory established the Kamakura Shogun, a hereditary military dictatorship. The samurai warrior trained by serving under his master and following a strict code called Bushido, the way of the warrior. In battle, the warrior would decapitate his defeated enemy and mount the head on a spike. For a samurai who was facing defeat or dishonor, seppuku or harakiri was performed. This involved the warrior committing suicide by cutting into his belly with a dagger. As part of Bushido, samurai who had lost their master were also expected to commit harakiri. Those who did not became ronin or drifters. Often there was stigma attached to being a masterless ronin, and many found other ways to make a living with their swords, becoming mercenaries or turning to crime. Samurai were experts in fighting both on horseback and on the ground. They used a variety of weapons, bows and arrows, spears, and eventually guns. However, their main and most symbolic weapon was the sword. In the late 13th century, Masamune Okazaki invented the unique dual structure of soft and hard steel that is one of the key characteristics of the katana. The sword came to have great significance, and eventually samurai would carry two types, the katana, a long sword, and the wakizashi, a short sword. In the 15th century, the shogun's power was waning, and a century-long period of fighting for dominance between local lords began, the Warring States period. 
Oda Nobunaga succeeded in uniting half of the clans in the late 16th century, but he was betrayed by one of his vassals and committed seppuku before national unification was complete. Stability was finally brought in the 17th century with the beginning of the Tokugawa shogunate, headed by Tokugawa Ieyasu. At this point, the social order was also frozen with samurai at the top of the social hierarchy. However, despite their high social position, the material well-being of many samurai began to decline. With relatively stable peace, the importance of martial skills declined, and many samurai took on careers as bureaucrats or teachers. Subscribe for more history videos. And the reason we have to look at the samurai is they are such an important part, even in terms of modern-day Japanese culture, in woodblock prints, whether it happens to be on television shows, or even when people go out and watch um, anime and cartoons that deal with the cultural past. The same way that we kind of have many things that deal with knights. And so one of the things that we have to show up and talk about within Japanese culture is how Japanese Zen and Shinto aesthetics impact the artwork today. So this is The Great Wave by um, Hokusai, probably the most famous Japanese artwork that we have in the Western world from 1831 from the Edo period. And when we actually look at it, it's a woodblock print. So the way woodblock works is it is you have a flat woodblock that you actually chisel off the area that you do not want to print. So each area here that you want to print is going to be represented of a different color. So if you look at the different colors, there's going to be a brown tan here, same as the sky. We're going to have this lighter blue, this very deep blue. We're going to have black outline, a little bit of a lighter blue. So there's going to be six different woodblocks that you have to have one for each um, point, or one for each color. And these are called okuyoi, pictures of the floating world. And to produce, they basically involve three different artists. An artist, the carver, a colorist, and the printmaker himself. Later on, these are gonna combine into one, and the artist is gonna be called the coloration, as well as the printmaker. These were very cheap, ephemeral art, affordable very much by everyone, including the poor. Um, and they weren't actually even in, in, in Japan actually seen as high art. It's not until later when the Impressionists start really getting fascinated with these because they come to wrap up in almost like tissue paper or wrapping paper that comes along with the Japanese tea sets that are being sent to Europe that the Europeans become fascinated with this. They start holding exhibitions of this beautiful art form and therefore the Japanese actually become more interested in their own what at that point was disposable tissue, tissue paper art form. There are different types of okuyo-i, uh, images of the floating world, and that is a, a Japanese and a Buddhist term, which basically means fleeting images and fleeting pleasures. The Buddhists believe in the idea of transformation, but that things change over time. And so it's okay to have pleasures of the flesh once in a while. It's okay to actually go out um, and have these wonderful days where you relax and you don't do a lot, as long as you only do it once in a while. It is the idea of living kind of the Buddhist life of the middle path. And so we have, here we see Nishiki-i, which are these beautiful brocaded pictures, with often with beautiful women wearing beautiful clothes. There are these natural landscapes that show up with the Great Wave by Hokusai, particularly those that show Mount Fuji and other religious holy Shinto um, areas of Japan. And then finally, there are kabuki actors for like celebrity culture. And this is generally where we see the samurai in to show up as well. To show you how common they are, here are 36 views of Mount Fuji. So these were basically little postcard size images, all created by Hokusai, and they're all different representation of the Shinto mountain of Mount Fuji. And you can basically take a walk, a three-dimensional walk around. And if you're very lucky when you're in Tokyo, you can actually see Mount Fuji off, off in the distance. Now, the same individual that is doing this, and this is why the warning is up here, is that the same individual doing it is creating very sexually explicit imagery done by Hokusai on the next slide. So if you are really offended by very frank sexuality, almost pornographic sexuality, turn your head for a moment or close your eyes for a moment. These are erotic shunga prints. Now remember, I said Buddhism is all about the pleasures of the, the fleeting flesh, the idea of the floating world, that it's okay to have these sexual kind of experiences once in a while, as long as they're just once in a while. And so these Shunga erotic prints can be patterns of a loving couple, or the most famous one over here, the dream of a fisherman's wife, literally about a woman being attacked 
or pleasured by sea creatures because they're so close to the sea within this aspect. And so this is something, now note, this is the same artist who actually is known, Hokusai, who is known for doing um, the, the great wave off of Kanagawa, which we saw, the most famous. Hiroshige basically did travel prints. So here's 53 stations off the Tokaido by Ando Hiroshige. And these are basically travel prints, like a travel journal where they would go around famous routes to experience the beauty of actually Japanese nature. And Hiroshige is especially noted for using these unusual vantage points, low angle, high angle, behind a tree, referring to different aspects of seasons and striking colors. So if we compare and contrast my lovely shirt here with Sony in Tokyo, Water Lilies by Monet with the Great Wave, what are some of the similarities and difference you see? And I'll give you a chance of pausing the video here and then we'll run through it in a moment. So you should pause the video if you don't wanna see the answer, you wanna to try to figure it out on your own. And here's what it is. It's what we talked about for impressionism. We're gonna have a simplified color scheme. We're gonna have very flat, unmodulated colors. We're gonna have high key, bright lighting, as they say, Monet never painted Mondays. Monet only painted weekends. We're going to have simplified forms that almost break down. Subject is going to be really unimportant, except it's going to be on nature, the power of nature in many capacities, or the beauty of nature. And the artistic style, that graphical representation, in particular here, or the impressionism style of placing little dots of blue and yellow wherever you see them, that's really what's going to dominate here. We saw this in Japanese, or actually Impressionism, where we compared the two. So this is an image you've probably already seen. And which one of these is a Japanese print? That is correct. The one up here on the left right behind me, as you can see, that is another Hiroshige. Note the date is 1857. The one on the right is a Van Gogh. Note, same title, same subject, same composition. The style is a little bit different, where we have more expressionist kind of the idea of emotional brush strokes that show up over here on Van, by Van Gogh or Van Gogh, by Van Gogh if you're actually in Europe. The one in the Van Gogh, unfortunately, is worth $71 million. This one over here was that throwaway art until it became famous later on. And even today, these might be able to get one of these from the original set from 1857 for somewhere between ten and $15,000. So there were a number of them that were made. Now we're gonna compare and contrast here we actually have the idea of the geisha. The geisha is the idea of female beauty, symbolic. And here we have Daruma, who is also known as the Bodhidharma. The Bodhidharma or Daruma down here is the Buddhist who actually brought Zen Buddhism into Japan out of China. So if we compare and contrast, this is geisha right in the middle. Geisha as Daruma crossing the Red Sea by Haranobu. And here we actually have a geisha with her gait and her walking. And here we have the lovely idea of the Ruwa Bodhidharma, that monk ascetic hermit bringing Zen. So what do they share and, and com or compare and contrast these two? Note, we're gonna have that asymmetry, which we see in Zen, that shows up with the branch. Note, she's floating on a branch, almost control of nature, but we also see that absolute control with the high-heeled shoes as gauges have to walk around. So this is on some of comparing the two. Now, in order to make a fair comparison, we kind of have to know what a geisha is. And a geisha is that idea of a moving work of art. She has to know how to play the koto, this beautiful musical instrument. She has to know how to do paper folding, called origami. She has to know and understand how to analyze Zen rock gardens. She has to know how to prepare tea and flower arrangement, called ikebana. She has to know how to do the fan dance, also know a lot about sumo wrestling because sometimes she is your date to go on the sumo wrestling and she prepares and everything with her own makeup in these beautiful lacquerware boxes. So to show you this idea of a moving work of art, here is from Memoirs of a Geisha, a moving work of art. Just like an artist needs and geishas then in a geisha house became competitive. So you are fighting for clients against other individuals. So you're going to see all the training. Here's preparing for dancing in the fan dance. 
graceful, balanced movement at all times. You have to be able to bow correctly, absolutely grace and elegance. So they're going to correct even her bow. She said, you bow like a perfectly great pig farmer, not like an elegant lady of the court. They have to prepare their own makeup. And when they go out, they're always made up. Because when they go out, they are not an individual. They are actually a geisha. And so still today, you can go and train to be a geisha. You have to be able to walk in these shoes and turn a man's face with one particular look. Note that right outside a Japanese rock garden. Now, you and I, as Westerners, are not allowed to go and visit the geisha. They may show up at a meeting or a business meeting. They are serving tea or that's someone hired that's Japanese. But this really is for Japanese individuals to partake of. And they are not prostitutes. So you're not hiring a prostitute or concubine to have sex with. You are hiring her for her skills. It's like hiring a professional artist to go along with you. Now, a geisha is a very expensive proposition and they do quite well. If they do become pregnant, either with someone they willingly sleep with or someone they actually um, are kind of married to, they will generally take time off because while they're a mother and around children, the idea of the illusion of the perfect available female is no longer there. The illusion is destroyed. Geishas will sell sex one time. They'll sell their virginity. That's called a mishawagi. And that basically pays for all of the training, which can be thousands of dollars. And so uh, a geisha may sell her mishawagi, her virginity, for as high as twenty to $30,000. But you can see the elegant nature. Everything is supposed to be absolute feminine. And so this is a role model that Japanese women have to live up to if they want to be considered an absolute beauty with movement and geisha. And yet geishas go through years and years of training to be able to have these various motions and movements, makeup, fan. It pretty is remarkable. So think about the pressures amongst Japanese women it's almost impossible to compete with the geisha here. And you'll note, when it looks and stares between different geishas, it is a competitive market. And geishas then do quite well for themselves. Again, remember they are not concubines, they are moving works of art. And that's what they are actually creating here. A sense of illusion of perfection outside. And those were all clips then from memoirs of the geisha. So the question for us, is this a fair comparison for ideal femininity? Why or why not? I mean, we talk about Queen B literally being charge of the world, queen of the world. And so is this a fair comparison? And that's something for all of you to decide. Now, as we look at Japanese culture and its impact today, one of the things we have to consider is film. Japanese, the top 10 list of the most important filmmakers of all time, you probably can name some of these individuals that are up here. And none of them, all of them are even on the top 10 list. But the one that we have to talk about from, from Japan is Akira Kurosawa, who you may have never heard of, but you may have heard of a film called The Seventh Samurai or Rashomon, generally considered two of the 20 best films that have ever been made. And the most influential directors of all time, when we actually look at that list, Note, Akira Kurosawa is number five on that list. And again, a lot of the films have to do with samurai culture. So we watched the video earlier on. So the most important video director or film director of all time is generally Walt Disney. 54 Academy Awards. He's got 18 Academy Awards after he died. He was so innovative. So then we have Orson Welles, who's spelled there, which means E after the double L. D.W. Griffith, 
Sergei Eisenstein, and then Akira Kurosawa. Then Fellini, Hitchcock, Bergman, Scorsese, and Stanley Kubrick. Um, and so many of these are the old directors that establish what cinema actually still looks like today that individuals like Quentin Tarantino are still reacting against. Look at all the first that Akira Kurosawa does in his career from 1910 to 1998. I should have mentioned upon his death, he is best friends with Martin Scorsese, they're buddies. And so number one, the telephoto lens. The idea of using a telephoto lens in film so you can actually get up and close to the action from a distance was his idea. The idea of using multiple cameras to film the same scene, his idea. Before this was one camera, you cut, you had to reenact it. Using weather elements to tell the story, like in a horror film where it's raining in nighttime, his idea. The idea of a frame wipe that we see so much in Star Wars, where all of a sudden it goes whoosh, and the thing is gone. Whoosh, that is actually completely his idea. The idea of used costumes that were already ruffled and it's for, to show someone who's actually a samurai, that was actually first his ideas. The idea of a finished musical score, his. The idea of spaghetti westerns. Spaghetti westerns are basically American cowboy movies that are basically based upon samurai movies that Italians funded. That's why they were called spaghetti westerns. The idea of a fractured narrative, where a narrative you learn in piecemeal, like we see in many films today, such as Fight Club, Interstellar has this, Inception has this. Um, the modern hero in almost every capacity. A group modern hero, Kurosawa. Love interest that's not a hero, Kurosawa. An unrelated plot, Kurosawa. The reluctant hero that doesn't want to be a, a hero, Kurosawa. Basically, and he basically used this all with samurai culture that we turned into our superhero movies of today. And the other individual that you got to know from film from the time period and from Japanese culture, and probably all of you know, Hayao Miyazaki, who is just fantastic. He hates, he hates being called a Japanese Disney, hates it, but yet the comparison is pretty accurate for the impact he has on the culture. Their films are radically different, as we'll see from a video that's coming up here. So here is a video that does a fantastic job talking about the essence and the humanity of Miyazaki's work. One consistent theme in my work is to watch good animation and surpass it. That was a quote from Hayao Miyazaki in 1978, and ever since then he's developed a filmography compiled of some of the greatest animated masterpieces in cinematic history. For 40 years, Miyazaki's dexterity and creativity has dazzled audiences through his feature length animations to become the undisputed master of his craft. Only those whose names have become synonymous with the medium could profess to a career as consistently successful and celebrated as his. But how has Miyazaki maintained not only critical acclaim, but a far-reaching audience. Unlike his native land, in the West there still remains a stigma that most animation is solely for children, and thus animation that's creative typically tends to avoid the more burdensome themes we're accustomed to in our live-action films. However, Miyazaki is not your typical animator. He took an approach to animated filmmaking that concentrates on the emotional intricacies of his subjects, as opposed to creating, ironically, cartoony characters. His aim wasn't to make things that spoke down to children, his aim was to make films that would help us all further understand the human condition. Movies such as The Curious Adventures of Mr. Wonderbird and Hakujiden were Miyazaki's inspirations for how he would approach animation. Always admiring the early works of Disney for their technical abilities, but thought their emotional depictions were far too simplistic. Early days of animation could get away with being somewhat shallow, but Miyazaki sought to change that, famously hating the prescribed label of the Japanese Disney. A more appropriate title would be a Japanese Yori no scene. As Miyazaki's animations aren't about their external flair, but their internal subtleties. He stated numerous times that the film Snow Queen showed him animation's potential in its depiction of human emotion. These influences are what form the filmmaker we have today, setting him apart from his contemporaries. A combination of skill and proficiency of Western animators with an approach of Eastern sensibility. 
because Miyazaki's foundations for his films are found through empathy and reality. Empathy captured by the audience self-projection on the characters and reality through the honest depiction of the unpredictability of people's lives. Above everything, if we wanted to know what makes a Miyazaki film a Miyazaki film, then all we need to look at is the emotional element. Miyazaki has stated that at the core of all his stories, there must be a sense of realism. A mist of gods, demons and fantasy elements is the human side that's always prioritised. His focus often lies on human nature and what can be understood irrespective of culture, characters that are fully fleshed out with clear goals. The starting point of any character is to understand what it is they want. Make it clear what your character wants to achieve, otherwise they'll have no obstacles to overcome. Keep it simple. Lupin wants to save Lady Clarice. That's all we need. You've got an objective. But none of it matters if your characters have no three-dimensionality. Miyazaki begins the humanization of his characters through the purely visual means of character movement. Beginning his career as a manga artist, who was influenced by a style known as Gekiga, a form of manga akin to more serious storytelling and as a result, more realistic drawings. See, Miyazaki has serious problems with the anime industry, and he's spoken openly about his distaste for its often cheap tactics of achieving audience reaction through the overexpressionism of its characters. And so he tends not to focus on the large, flashy movements in his animations, but the more subdued, subtle ones. The characters he presents to us come with familiar idiosyncrasies, whether it's someone walking on their knees to avoid treading on a carpet, or a little girl tapping her shoes to ensure they're on correctly. It's actions like these that enrich the characters of Miyazaki, as it often can be something as simple as the minutiae of an action that can emphasize who that character is. His characters can be extremely expressive at times, and the quality of the animation most definitely helps us. But for the more indistinct actions, we see characters who don't have to think about what it is they're doing, and so we get a chance to see characters essentially at their most primal, spend time on arbitrary actions, and it shows us how that character thinks through how they approach things. Are they careful and precise, or clumsy and stubborn? Small details at such a precise degree is what make Miyazaki characters feel human, because we recognize the basic tasks they perform that other filmmakers wouldn't include, and we gain emotional insight to a character when they're at their most recognizable. But the reason Miyazaki is able to capture the nature of people so well is because above all else, he understands people. She's kind of a lazy bum. Which is exactly the way that my favorite ten-year-old girls are. You lazy bum, I want to tell them. But I know their inner resources are as rich as Chihiro's. Miyazaki studies people, and his comprehension of human behavior is displayed through the plethora of actions within his characters. He never reuses the same expression, even with something as basic as running. His character actions have innumerable variations, as their behaviors are drawn through what the character feels at that moment. Is the character fearful? Mournful? or filled with joy. Any emotion can be displayed if not what your character does, but how they do it. With the implementation of this technique, the character never loses their vitality. Miyazaki's animation should be watched from the perspective of our own lives, because his goal is for us to understand ourselves better through the people of his stories. The truthfulness of his characters is how this is achieved. A character like Mei is single-minded, and Kiki can be rude, but character imperfections are necessary for realism. Audiences can't identify with someone that's been written to be perfect. We need some commonalities, and character shortcomings are a requisite for this. Nobody's perfect, and Miyazaki enforces a vital rule when making any character. Just because they're the protagonist, it doesn't make them infallible. <coughs> it's another example of how Miyazaki gets us to realize our familiarities with characters. Who doesn't remember clutching something close when you were nervous, or holding grudges because of a jealous tiff? Nostalgia is prevalent in a Miyazaki animation, with characters often being representations of something we discarded in growing up. That feeling of yearning for a time past is experienced by all of us. However, in a Miyazaki film, we use a surrogate for this emotion and enjoy a world of unique experiences. By having his characters magnify the elements of ourselves that we recognize the most and present it to us in such a realistic manner, these characters become humanized and humanizing is the way Miyazaki develops an empathic bond between the audience and his films.
、それからあの、本当に心に穴が開いてしまった悪役を出すと、映画全体が本当に悲んだものになりますから、それはやっぱり書きたくないんですね。あの、アニメーターが仕事やってる時に見ると、こう笑顔を描いてる時は笑顔になってるんです。それから悪役を描いてる時は、大変嫌な顔して描いてますから、なるべく笑顔の方が、長い方が映画としてはいいと思います。Miyazaki s attention to the subtleties of people displays a complexity, one that's present throughout the entirety of his worlds. It's interesting to see a filmmaker's philosophies permeate their filmmaking to such a degree as Miyazaki's have, but his process involves capturing what he sees in humanity, so really it shouldn't come as such a surprise that the themes of his films are often based around his social and spiritual beliefs. One theme often presented is the idea of animism, the notion of a spiritual kind of connection within all of nature. Although Miyazaki believes people to be a part of nature, and so they're incorporated into this connection too. By doing so, in a Miyazaki world, everything we see reflects the same traits that humans possess. Unlike traditional fantasy, Miyazaki doesn't portray morality as a simple binary. The dichotomy of good versus evil isn't present in these films. Everything and everyone displays elements of tenderness as well as elements of savagery. Nothing in the world is simply one or the other. Is an amalgamation of all emotions within the spectrum. The same way Lady Eboshi wants to destroy the forest, yet at the same time houses the sick and gives the inhabitants of Iron Town a good lifestyle, Miyazaki proposes a theme of morality that's complex. It's not shown to repress the negative aspects of humanity because they exist all around us, it's part of nature. Brutality and tenderness coexist without any contradictions in these worlds as they do in our own. This realism avoids pandering to an audience to give an unflinching view of our own existence. But the message we see is that the story is never about the protagonist winning, it's about the protagonist adapting and growing to a world that isn't built around their needs. We're confronted with harsh realities, however, they're addressed so that something better may arise. Many animations end with everything tied in a neat bow, saved by a Deus Ex Machina that solved everything, but there hasn't really been any development of the character. They achieve their goal without overcoming any long lasting personal obstacles. On the other hand, Miyazaki characters never end as the audience expected. They begin flawed and remain flawed, but their experiences have helped blossom their outlook. Ashitaka's scar may still remain, and no one may ever understand or believe Chihiro, but the solidarity and connection they've made with their world is an example of a spiritual liberation of the character instead of a material one. Remember how earlier I said you should always know what it is your character wants? Well, by the end of a Miyazaki film, a distinction is made between what it is the character wants and what the character needs. Sometimes the goal of your film should be where you want your character to end on an emotional level. Because even though our characters have clear goals, those goals are never as important as the characters themselves. Moments like this emphasize the priority of Miyazaki's human elements rather than fantasy. And I think it's important to take into account Miyazaki's attitude to filmmaking because a lot of this can simply be credited to the film's production. Miyazaki never studied screenwriting, and to this day, he leaves a lot up to feelings and intuition. It's a very interesting approach to filmmaking. This is the only director I know who does this. Scripts and storyboards are simultaneously worked on. <laughs> What effect does this have? Well, because no one knows how the story will end, it's never made the primary focus. Instead, many scenes are planned out individually, not as story threads, but simply as methods of conveying emotion. It's a technique wherein, if all we saw was the one scene, We would understand all of the emotional information that was there. To achieve this, Miyazaki simply continues to draw settings that evoke feelings. He's never concerned about plot in the early stages. Emotion is the key, and it's important to instill this in the audience before anything else. The reason as to why his films create atmospheres so well is because the imagery takes precedence, continually altering them during pre production with no other objective than to have them make us feel something. The impression of a landscape is dependent on the emotions of the person viewing the landscape. By displaying the world through the emotional perspective of the character, the world can reflect this emotion back. He rarely uses flat landscapes. His settings are typically in valleys, coves, or even the sky. Human sensibilities are often connected to the weather. All of these meticulous details are what fill the screen. 
And so when we wonder why Miyazaki films feel that bit bigger, that little bit calmer, it's because Miyazaki has taken the time to find the best way to replicate whatever mood the character emits through his worlds. Sentiment is what seeps from the pause of a Miyazaki film. Even the pacing is used in such a way to heighten the response of the audience. The fact that Miyazaki uses many high octane moments, it requires the slower ones in order to let the emotion have time to sink in. Western animation seems to be the antithesis of this, very rarely slowing down the action and almost never having the quiet moments that Miyazaki seems to often utilize. See, I often find silence and stillness to be the reflected moments of cinema, periods in which your audience shares a moment with your character simply to figure out their situation, or perhaps in turn, project their own feelings onto the character. Miyazaki will often let time slowly pass by for our characters, in the hope that the connection we've made with them is what speaks at that moment. We may wait at a bus stop, or we may travel along a silent train journey. But through the minds of our characters, we've related. It doesn't need to be explained. We know exactly what they're thinking. With worlds as alien and obscure as Miyazaki's, there's bound to be some elements that are left to our interpretation. But the thing is, we don't have to understand everything. Miyazaki's principle is emotion, not logic. And so a lot of his design of the fantasy aspect isn't explained. The reason for this is because an object is likely to attract our interest when we can't explain it. The creatures that Miyazaki creates are often ambiguous in their actions. We don't know what they're thinking. The more that thing is anthropomorphized, the more we're able to empathize, but the less intriguing it becomes. Miyazaki reserves empathy for his human elements and mystery for his fantasy elements. Sometimes it's better not to offer explanations, because giving a reason doesn't clarify the problem. <laughs> Miyazaki once said, if I were asked to give my view of what animation is, I would say it's whatever I want to make. Gods and spirits may be the surface of his films. And those those gods and spirits come out of Japanese ideas of Shinto and Zen, the kami. Shinto meaning the way of the kami. And so that supernatural is just part and parcel of the Japanese way of looking and experiencing nature. mystery into consistency. It all comes down to empathy with people and reality of the world. In the end, Miyazaki offers a sense of liberation to his characters, and in turn, does so to us. We see people in a suffocating society, but ultimately show characters that become self-reliant, not through a tangible achievement, but an emotional one. Miyazaki has mastered a level of emotional filmmaking rivaled by few other filmmakers, where perhaps there is ambiguity throughout his works, and maybe it does have suspension of disbelief from the audience. But when it's removed from the world of logic and clinical analysis, the films make perfect sense, because no filmmaker understands the essence of humanity better than Hayao Miyazaki. And as most of you know, he keeps saying that this is going to be his last film, and this film's going to be his last film, and hopefully he will continue making films forever, because the films that he make, makes are amazing in terms of, you'll, it's, it's very rare to see an animated feature where you have grandparents and, and children all going, and no, there's a morality and a real essence that shows up here. Um, unlike Disney, when they want to show sadness, they develop sadness in one character, then any time that character is sad, you always see the same things all the time. Miyazaki, you see all sorts of different faces. So you might see sad once, but then you'll see downturned head, you'll see despondence, you'll see the whole range of human emotion in each character, showing that they are real lived, really experiential aspects. Um, and also, as this video makes a great point, is that the morality of each is explored, because that's really what humanity is. No one is always moral and always, um, always um, evil. We have kind of variations within everyone we see, and that's something Miyazaki is exceptionally gifted at doing, much more so than almost any other. And so this leads us to Japanese manga, anime, and cosplay, which in Japan, I have to say, if you've never been there before, is off the hook. And so they have cosplay nights 
this is actually a Japanese manga store that's been walk in with anime. They, some of them are so large, they actually have vending machines enough that you can have dinner. You can actually rent a bed that pulls out of a drawer and you can sleep almost in bunk bed style. Um, this is only available to men. Women are not allowed. There's generally a store and a food shop. And here's a little area where you can actually basically live. Um, and so you can check in for the evening if you really want to spend. They're generally open 24 hours, particularly in the larger cities, and it's kind of a cool experience. Now, if you've never visited a cosplay park, even if you're not into cosplay yourself, particularly in Nigita, I would absolutely say go one night because their cosplay is off the hook. So here's Japanese cosplay night. And they have entire parks that are set up for this this Japanese cute culture, and it's amazing. So it's a very interesting scenario to see a grandfather dressed up like a superhero, like a samurai, playing with a 15-year-old girl who's just in a fairly sexualized costume, and Japan it matters not, because they are playing the role of the character. If you get on the Japanese subway, this is what everyone is reading, is anime and manga, and there's a whole range of different styles depending upon what age, what category that we'll talk about in a minute. It's just a fun time. This happens every Tuesday night. And people, of course, make their own costumes as well as buy their own costumes. It's just an amazing feature. So as you go to Tokyo, you will see it is everywhere. It is their popular culture. And what's nice is the popular culture that binds them together. It's adults, it's children, it's families, it's grandparents. Um, homeless individuals will actually participate as well. It kind of is a remarkable situation that brings everyone together. We really don't have this in our capacity. When Disney makes a film, even sometimes grandparents will take their children, but they're really taking for the children and maybe some jokes that Disney puts in. It's not really something about battling morality and about learning the way to work in the world as Japanese anime and manga do. And so there are various different types of Japanese anime and, and, and audience, as you can see. So here, and probably many of you will know some of these, Bishoji are those ones that are actually for beautiful girls. So the idea of beautiful girl, anywhere from eight to 10 years old, maybe as old as 12. We have Bishonin, uh, which is the exact same, only they are anime, or manga for beautiful boys. We have hentai or porono. This is actually the one that often gives us problems because the age of sexual consent in Japan is 16. So an image of a 16 year old woman or boy in this aspect would not be a problem. You report it here in the United States, that would be considered child pornography. Astro Boy, you probably all know, that's Kodomo. Those are designed for little boys in particular children. Josie, young, young women, those are rare. But what's cool about this one was Nana. What's cool about it, they deal with young women actually getting into the marketplace, with young women actually entering. So they deal with real issues that people are going through. We have Mecha, where Transformers ultimately comes out of. But the idea is these mechanized robotic weapons, these Moe, these cute aspects, and uh, a lot of times fairies will show up in these types as well. We have the progressive arts, or really the artsy side, such as Voices of a Distant Star, which try to overwhelm you in their technical mastery and just how amazing they are. There we go. We have Sinan for young males. We have Sentai, superhero groups, which is where the Avengers come from. 
Shoujo for Little Girls, The Idea of Fruits Basket, that one's probably one you guys know. Magical Girl, the one we actually see all the time, is Sailor Moon, and that really is all the way up through college. Shoujo, a lesbian, literally Shoujo I is actually for a lesbian. So in Japan, because they have Buddhism and not so much Christianity, which preaches that lesbian is homosexuality is wrong, they don't actually care nearly as much as we particularly do about homosexuality. Note you'll have Loveless, which is Shonen I for anyone in the LGBTQ community. And then you have all sorts of toys and things that come up about Bakugan. It is everywhere, this popular cutesy culture, no matter what they're doing. And they'll deal with elderly that are working with young girls and um, a 40 year old man that is actually having problems with his daughter that's 15. And so men can actually read this to understand the perspective of their, their 15 year old girl. And a 15 year old girl can read it to understand the, the, the aspect of what her parents are trying to get to. So it's just a fantastic aspect of the way everyone unites brings culture together. And the person who's bringing this all together, particularly with the, the uh, pop art movement, is Tendonori Yuku, born in 1936, and really a Japanese graphic designer, illustrator, printmaker, painter, who's at the forefront of Japanese popular culture, mixing things such as samurai and geisha and pop art and op art and the stories that come out of anime. We also have post-minimalism, and this one is Isamu Noguchi, and basically creates these very minimalist zen-like architecture to get people to experience the world in a new way. So here's a lovely one, a monument to Benjamin Franklin, which is 80 feet high, but in Philadelphia to show you where the kite and electricity was invented. Here, the California scenario, trying to get to illustrate plate tectonics and how they rip apart over time in this public park. We have black slide mantra where you climb up literally on the interior, as you can see here, and come out the other side for children to play in a sunken garden in New York because there's no place for land. So we sunk it down to the level of what the subway would be. You get this beautiful water fountain in this mist on hot summer days in an area where there is really um, not a lot of green here outside of Central Park. Japanese modern architecture, as you can see from where I'm standing behind me, the same scene is over the top, very kind of New York, very modernist. So here you can see Mount Fuji. And the need was to rebuild after World War II because of earthquakes, World War II bombings, and rapid economic growth, most city architecture was the height of what brutalist modernist architecture that we talked about in our own modernist architecture, 1945, 1950s, 1960s. So you can see the square cubist boxes that appear almost everywhere here. That's what they had to re rebuild with until the modern day. Until, and that really, one of the people that's at the forefront of it is a Japanese architect, Minoru Yamasaki. He is in charge of, or was in charge of creating the World Trade Center and looking at the importance of these square cubist like box that became part of that international style, as well as housing projects for the poor, which really were a disastrous failure as we now know, but all the poor individuals in one neighborhood, in those neighborhoods on some level, breed poverty and crime because there's no job, there's no one moving in, there's no grocery stores. The people literally can't find a job because there's nothing in the local area. And the public housing then is not directly tied to the best transportation to get to places or schools or education where they could actually get out of poverty. This is not what um, Minoru Yamasaki wanted to do. He wanted to have schools and malls and businesses here that the residents could work in to have middle-class wages that part was never realized in the United States. And so these were built in St. Louis and destroyed about 40 years later. They were an absolute failure because they did not meet with what Minoru Yamasaki wanted to do. Another very famous postmodern architect is going to be Kengo, here we go, up here. Um, and this is Tango Kanze, Tango. The idea of infusing Japanese aesthetics this idea of the natural world and the asymmetry that shows up a lot in Japanese aesthetics into modern proportions, particularly using things such as tatami mats, which are flat reed mats that you would actually see in a tea house. And of course, many of you have seen this before on the left, the Team Disney building in Orlando, Florida, a really cool library for Qatar, where they actually have massive sand dunes that can pile up. And so, this is a way of keeping everything safe within it. And so that's by Usozaki Arata. So you can see architecture. So the challenge from A to Z, think of an artwork, personality, invention, or aesthetic 
from each letter of the alphabet about Japan. And let's see in 10 minutes if you can't come up with that. Pause this, time yourself for 10 minutes, and let's see if you can't find one. And then finally, the modern issues facing Japan today. They have an aging and shrinking population. Global climactic change, because it is an island nation, is really involving the fish population. As the, wa the waters get warmer, there's less reproduction of the cold water fish that serves so much of the Japanese healthy diet. China is currently building islands in the South China Sea and claiming territorial rights just off the coast of Japan. And so we may be moving closer and closer to armed conflict um, between these two really kind of superpowers within the world. They are just hitting feminism. So the idea of women's rights and poverty, so much so that there are women only, um, during rush hour, women only mass transit, because with so many women were getting touched and felt up within it, it's been a masculine derived culture coming out of Bushido um, and samurai culture. And they have some of the highest suicide stress rates in the world. And that is because it's family-based, structural-based. And so if you, when people, well, kind of like in Japan or in China, if people say, hey, tell me about yourself, you tell them about your family. And if your family is all A student and you best you can do, even with working hard as a B, you might want to kill yourself. Because in that capacity, you are not living up to the Japanese style of promoting your family, what your family has done for you. You're kind of an eyesore for your family. So there's actually a national campaign that's been going on in Japan for B students, just B students, not to harm themselves, not to kill themselves, not to get so high stressed. So we're not even talking about C and D students. We're talking B students that come out of very powerful families that are doctors, lawyers, judges, that just can't keep up academically or don't want to keep up academically with their family, but their entire family is judged upon it. So there's some real issues, and this is true anywhere around the world. Everywhere has issues. This, this is Japan. This is modern Japan. What amazing society. Clean, beautiful, friendly, lovely, nice. One of the most organized, best opportunities for you to ever have. Travel is easy. They have pop high culture. Um, they have some of the greatest food restaurants around here. They're overly friendly. Nighttime is safe within the concept. So there's some spectacular national parks. So really it is a modern society well worth visiting. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Bye.